What's up, everybody? Now, I should start this video by saying I'm not going to be going into controls for crabgrass. That's something that you can find on my channel as well as a plethora of others out there to talk about what you can apply to your particular turf type, how to use pre-emergence properly, and make sure that you don't have a severe crabgrass infestation. The couple of things I can tell you is it's important to make sure your irrigation is correct, that your lawn is thick, that you're mowing properly, and that you're feeding on the right schedule. Now that that's out of the way, we can get through the rest of it. All right, firstly, let's go ahead and establish what this species is and learn a little bit more about it. Now, if you're unfamiliar with crabgrass, good for you. Most people have to deal with it all through North America. It invades lawns, parks, park strips, cracks in the sidewalk, golf courses, you name it. It grows pretty much everywhere. It's a very well adapted grassy plant species. You should know that crabgrass is an annual. So the plant that you see growing right there this year is not the same one that's going to be growing there next year. However, it is very prolific at reproducing. So here is what that means to you. One single plant can produce up to 150,000 seeds. That is significant. Now, that doesn't mean that every single one of those seeds is going to grow, but I have been on lawns that it has looked that bad. So, wow, wow, hmm. wow. I the think plant we can all also have. produce up to wow. 700 John Perry a is in the house today. And 700, as a matter of uh, fact. So if, it is if, still if, going to if be you able don't to know who he is, move along you're going to the find out here in a second. Left what I'm showing you right now, now is the beauty of this page particular grass is that it is that's highly amazing. adaptable. So if, if, if you're not following like on YouTube, YouTube go over you, there right now. But to me, it really to is because this isn't something that shows up and then turns your lawn bad. It actually is an indicator that you're today. We are live with the one and only the man, the myth, the legend, somebody I call a friend a mentor in the space, John Perry. Thanks for coming on Lawnbot Live today. Thank you, Kendall. I am very happy to be here from the comfort of my own couch. Where is that couch, by the way? Where, where are well, you? Well, it's in my den, of course. Well, where's, oh. where's the den? Like, uh, I live in Park City, Utah. Okay, awesome. Yeah. We, we have a few customers that have been on Lawnbot Live in Utah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, John, thanks for coming on the show today. I know that uh, this is going to be one of our probably most viewed episodes because you have such a cult following with what you do and um, this kind of movement you've created in the lawn care space. So I thought it was a natural um, person I wanted to bring onto the show because the things you're doing are really exciting for our industry. So thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, man, I'm happy to be here. It's uh, it's pretty fun. It's been a very interesting year. I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit just oh, with, yeah. uh, you know, uh, what we're going to see, I think, in the future with changes in marketing and everything that you're doing and uh, contactless sales and all that kind of fun stuff. So yeah, this will be this will be fun to talk about. So tell me about who's John Perry today, right? Like, so who are who, for people that don't know you, or maybe they're just running into you on this stream for the first time. Who are you and, and, and what do you do? Sure. OK, so uh, I'm the president of Green County Fertilizer Company. Uh, I also do uh, Longcology on YouTube. I have a blog that actually predated YouTube for a number of years, uh, longcology.com. Uh, so I've been writing and speaking and doing product development uh, for, uh, I date back now to, to 2003 really was the beginning of the journey, I would say, in in uh, the facet that we're in right now. Yeah. Um, and so really for me day to day, what this sort of looks like for me these days is I am at home. I'm at home full time. I have two little kids that I'm homeschooling and uh, working throughout all of that as well. So at this point, I think I'm more of just a talking head uh, <laughs> than anything else. It's really what it seems like. Well, you know, it's funny. I ran into you uh, on YouTube before I even met you uh, kind of through this green industry transition I've been making from operating a lawn care company to like going into the vendor side of it and software. And I ran into you on YouTube and, and I was like, man, how many hats does John Perry wear? I mean, mm -hmm. and now you're a great father, uh, you know, and, uh, somebody that, you know, you helped me. I just had a, a baby recently and I uh, know it's amazing helping me along the way with that. So, um, let's talk about I, what I like to do with folks that come on this show is, Ask that getting into the green industry is uh, 
not something that, you know, when you're in elementary school, maybe you did because you love turf and the science of soil and everything. But how did you get into the green industry? Like, uh, was your family in it? Like, how did you get into this whole deal of caring for plant health and specifically turf grass? Yeah, actually, uh, a few things there that you, you hit the nail right on the head. So, uh, my, my mother was actually a landscaper. Uh, so she had myself and my older sister out on properties early on, um, just even when I was a baby. So she had just sort of a side business when I was growing up. So I was, I was always out there and she very much had a green thumb. Um, and I think like every other kid that grew up in the eighties, you can't relate to that. Uh, I, uh, you know, (laughs) we, uh, you know, we're out mowing grass at an early age. Uh, I grew up in Houston. I was taking care of that St. Augustine down there early on, um, had a, a little multi, um, I did probably, well, I probably did like five, five or six lawns for people in my neighborhood, even at that time. Um, not, so I was just sort of always out on the grass and, and that yeah. led into my teenage years. Uh, when we moved to Utah, my mom decided to get back into landscaping. And so I was helping her with that. And, uh, when she was sort of done and mo- moved along to something else, I went to work at, uh, the park city nursery here and just was sort of in the horticultural side from day one. Um, I can't say that I necessarily thought I would be doing that today, that I would still be in that line of work, um, and supporting that industry. I, uh, but I did know that I wanted to work outside. I'm not, I'm not really all that great at being in an office. So it, it yeah. all kind of worked out for me. So that gets us through, how did you get into the green space? And a lot of people, maybe not even, they probably don't even know this about you, but you actually used to run a lawn care company mm-hmm. um, initially. Uh, I did. Tell a little bit about that. Like, I, I know, I think people would be really interested to hear that um, you, you went from running a lawn care company or pr- wanting to start a franchise, right, mm-hmm. to going into the fur fir- fir- distribution side of the business. So I think that's a really interesting story. Tell me a little bit about that. So yeah, that's um, pretty much how it went. I I started out uh, with a spray service. Um, Here, I was doing a lot of tree work, actually um, fertilizing trees and things like that. That kind of got me moving into the fertility side, starting to pick up lawn accounts. And that's what gave birth to BioGreen, the spray service. Um, And that was back in 2002, 2003, kind of that time. And um, so I I had that going. And and by about 2004, uh, I had one going in Reno, Nevada as well. So I started a transition to move out to Nevada, uh, which didn't actually happen until about 2007. But the business was functioning in two states to begin with. And then we just mainly focused on the Nevada side. Um, But, you know, uh, just a a typical LNO, all liquid company, um, focusing on more of the um, bio-based type, uh, fertility. And uh, the model for me was always going to be, uh, like a licensure, like a franchise, uh, which you're very familiar with, but it was, it was more of licensing the brand and the model. Yeah. And since I had, uh, the, the product control, that was actually how the company was going to make its money was by producing and selling fertilizer. So, the first few people that we started licensing to, which was in 2006, 2007, in that range, while I was still operating the spray service, um, that's basically what it did. The, the trucks looked exactly, you know, it, it looked like it would have been a franchise. And that that grew fairly quickly. Uh, I would say by the time we sort of backed off from, from doing licensees, I, I want to say we had somewhere around like 80, 86 of them around the country, something like that. Six. Okay. Wow. So I, I think this is one thing that maybe a lot of people in the turf nerd, I, in turf nerd, I say that with, I am a turf nerd, by the way. <laughs> um, I think it's amazing to take a lawn that's, that's ugly and looks bad and make it green, thick and weed free. Um, I think that's something that a lot of maybe people in the turf uh, health space don't really realize about you is you're a badass entrepreneur. Like you started out, you started this lawn spray company you were moving forward. I mean, why, why, where did the big pivot come from running? You know, I want to build this huge like licensing play to sell fertilizer in turf health products. So it was, it was always side by side. Those, those two things went right along with each other. The only reason that I, um, 
I was initially approached by people because they loved what they were seeing. Competitors of mine in, in my space were seeing what I was doing with lawns and they started actually buying fertilizer from me before I even started licensing. So there was, um, there was already like a need or a want for what I was doing with, right. with the liquids. And that, that would just became very clear that that was the direction that it needed to go. And the spray service essentially funded the, the manufacturing side for the first while because it was all just getting off the ground. And, you know, when you're way out West and your first couple of people are, you know, a thousand miles away, 1500 miles away, yeah. there, were, there were a lot of logistics that had to be learned very quickly. Um, but we grew, which was interesting, we grew in the state of Florida extremely fast. Um, once the material was being shipped down there and people were seeing what it was doing, word spread and it kind of caught like a uh, wildfire and we were able to really establish a good foothold in a year round market, which helped to push the rest of the, the country because it was a constant yeah. influx of income. So that was, that was very much my design. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we had 12 month growing seasons, at least as part of our books, that we were, were getting good, good sales uh, 12 months a year instead of getting short um, in the Midwest. And um, we, we've stayed very, very strong in Florida. We actually have a, a warehouse and, and distribution center down there as well, uh, just to support our, our customers in Florida. That's amazing. So what was, what was, uh, you know, Brad, Brad was telling me this story, uh, about how you guys kind of came together and, um, said, you know what, we're going to make this, we're going to make a go at it. And, um, yeah, what happened with Biogreen? Did you guys kind of scale that down and then scale up the fertilizer or how did, how did, how did that whole thing go down? Yes and no. So, uh, Biogreen continued to actually continues to go today. There's still quite a few licensees out there. Uh, so but what we, 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 we love Biogreen. That's okay. right. So we've got, uh, uh, there was sort of a merger that happened at the end of 2019 so that uh, Green County and Biogreen were one company. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that they were functioning as two separate corporations there up until the end of 2019. So it, it's all under one umbrella now. It's all, it's all owned in one space, which is nice. And um, we will actually continue to do licenses, uh, licenses to people if anybody really wants them. And we continue to support that. We still have, you know, all of this Biogreen stuff going. But I can tell you one thing that happened is in the mid 2000s, and I would say leading up into the middle part of the recession, um, there was a lot of greenwashing going on just across the board. And that was in from household chemicals to food to whatever. It was just like everything was pitched as some sort of a natural or an organic or a this or a that and all this kind of stuff. And, and I think that it really washed out the space. Um, and not that we were trying to be an organic company, but when you have a name like Biogreen, that's the first thing people think is that you're an organic company, right? Totally. Uh, which really was never the case. It was, uh, we were very much a hybridized fertilizer that you know used organic components and, and used just standard uh, fertility components to, to have a good marriage of the two. Mm -hmm. So um, it felt like th there were probably 40 or 50 biogreen companies that were totally unrelated, not in the lawn care space, from mattresses to bottles to clothing. I mean, it was uh, so it kind of washed out a little bit. And uh, so we decided to just sort of let it get a little breathing room. And, and now it seems like that's come a little bit more full circle, like we're coming back into a time where that more bio side is understandable. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with branding and marketing and things that we've done the last couple of years with biostimulants. Um, that's brought a lot more uh, awareness into that market space. So, you know, the, it, it could potentially have another resurgence on the on the licensee side. What do you what do you think? I mean, you're you're now coming into a space where there's billion dollar players in the space, mm -hmm. right? Uh, with Site One, Helena, all these huge huge fertilizer distributors. Do you view yourself as disruptive? I mean, is for that, sure. I, I mean, you're basically coming in. Is that did, did, you didn't set out to be a disruptive company. You just followed this path of something you enjoyed doing and it was working better. I mean, yeah. Uh, so in terms of like, what's the hardest thing you find when you're trying to break into this with these incumbents that are huge? Okay. So this has been the best part. This is what I've really enjoyed about this journey because there, there have been some, some things to overcome. And one of them was this in the beginning, when I was first going out and, and, uh, talking to companies in different states and, and doing PowerPoint presentations and stuff like that. You know, I was coming in with this, uh, with a different model that really 
lowered the amount of uh, needed nitrogen and showed how we can build soil profiles and, and, and do all these things to get like a more sustainable system that actually ended up costing the operator less, which obviously creates more profits and just gives an overall better result. And a lot of that had to do um, with just putting together the componentry that I had. So in the beginning, there was a lot of push just against that, like from the big players of saying, no, you know, none of this stuff has any sort of viability. We've got to pump, furt, pump, furt, pump, furt. And, and I always just sort of sat there and was like, this is great because I'm watching these people who are going to have to pivot. At yeah. some point, they're going to have to say, oh, we need to be in that space and we need to understand that space. And we just sort of grew and grew and, and, and got bigger and bigger and bigger and got wider spread. And then I started seeing all those big players like, oh, hey, check out this brand new product that you've never heard of. And then, you know, a customer would show it to me and say, yeah, haven't you been doing this for 15 years? Like, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> the stuff, you yeah. know. So so it was kind of cool to watch the whole industry start to shift a little bit more into, I'm not going to say a, a full sustainability model, but to offer more, you know, maybe maybe bio-based, more soil first is really what I'm going to say, more, more soil first type products and that enhance fertility and there's just more and more data coming out about that every day on on how much more effective you can be when you're using the right componentry yeah i noticed that i mean uh i grew up on the lawns so i remember going into the old lesco dealer with my dad and literally there was i, I was in the industry before the you know uh when, when guys are still throwing down triple 19 on every app like mm -hmm. that thing apparently and um it's interesting to think about where things are at today when you see other uh, products that are trying to maybe ride on the coattails of the path that you guys cut for the space around um, types of carbon based and adding soil fertility and stuff like that. So I think that's super interesting. Why is, why is soil fertility important? I mean, uh, for folks that are watching this, I'm sure folks are watching and asking, well, why is soil fertility even important? to them or the world, why, why is it important? You know, there, there's a few things that I think that we maybe take for granted in the space and, and I'll back into that triple 19 comment that you made. So, you know, a long time ago, really, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but in the early stages of professional lawn care, a lot of what was being done was three applications a year. It slowly moved into a four application a year, which evolved into a five application a year, which went to six. Now we've got 12 and probably somebody's going to come up with the 13th month at some time. So um, th the model has changed for a variety of reasons. And, and, and I bring that up for this. Before there was like really heavy fertility and, and people really pumping up lawns, it seemed as though you could get a lawn to go a little bit further when it was grown on whatever natural soil that was there or whatever you had. And then as you increased fertility, the demand for fertility also went up. Okay, so so it was sort of a combo. Like as, as more fertilizer was applied, more fertilizer was needed. Right. And part of that is just because a, a portion of what you're feeding, especially from the nitrogen side, is going to get into the soil to feed microbial life and that has to eat on something. And so you end up chewing up some of your topsoil reserves over time, which leads to harder ground, harder landscapes. And you need more of that, um, you know, that standard fertilizer to be put down so that the grass can actually take up of what it needs. So when you switch the approach a little bit and you start to pump down into the soil system that will actually drive your roots deeper and allow water to penetrate deeper and you just start get a little bit more movement there's a few things that happen and one is that your fertilizer becomes more effective the more space that it has to work which is nice so deeper roots have more opportunity to take up more nutrition so it's, it's a big thing so more roots you got then the other part of it is is water holding capacity alone so if we're having this housing boom again, you know like we did 10 years ago and, and there's more lawns being put down all over the place and there's more um, more demand on water systems. It's important to consider the soil as um, like more like a sponge uh, rather than you're just trying to keep your grass alive, but a place to sort of store water for your lawn too. So again, when you have healthier soil, more arable soil, more organic matter in your soil, you can you can water a lot less, which will be huge for us going forward. Right, because not everybody's as blessed as we are here in Michigan. Uh, literally, it's raining out, and their sprinkler systems just 
going on. Of course. It's yeah. it's nuts so out there with with, with the water. <laughs> let's let's get into air raid. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh I've been on the Facebook groups. I know a lot of people watching this. We stream out to Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, all of the groups. There's been some controversy over air raid pop up recently. I want to dive into that a little bit. Now, full disclosure, we used air rate in my company. Uh, it does help us not have to call for sprinkler heads and things like that. Cause obviously when traditional core aeration is a pain in the ass and anybody in the lawn care industry knows that because you got to call mark your sprinkler head. Maybe they didn't, maybe they missed one. Maybe there's a valve box out there. So from a customer service, a scheduling standpoint it can be really difficult sometimes to uh, do that effectively at scale. I'm talking thousands of aerations. So mm-hmm. beside that, let's get into aerate a little bit. So yeah. for folks that are watching this, uh, why is air rate important and does it replace core aeration? Okay, great question. So uh, first, core aeration is core aeration. So we'll put that into a bucket over here, right? So uh, if you're going to go out and aerate mechanically, I, I think it's great. I don't think it's necessary all the time. So that was more uh, the reason for the aerate product. Now, what we've been doing with it for the last number of years... Um, can't even think of how long it's been now, five five years, probably five years with that, is that you do not have to mechanically aerate as often because we are creating, again, a little bit more space. We're creating deeper rooting. We're allowing that more arable soil that I was talking about before. Yeah. So the whole concept behind that product to begin with and, and the reason it was kind of fun. Now, there's some meager data on like using like using um, like liquid humic acids that people have been trying to do for kind of like a, a ground penetrant or, or they may have marketed it as a liquid aeration or something like that. But the concept came a little bit further for me on where I wanted to get this um, was basically doing our reactions in our tanks and we were making humic, uh, which we make a lot of. And, and I was really thinking about the process of how that reaction uh, releases the acids from the carbon material that it's tied to. So I started doing some tests out on some pretty, compacted and troublesome areas just to see if I could recreate that in the ground to where we could get some level of like a flushing effect in a way and and allow for um, greater water penetration and maybe some more space for the roots and maybe free up some of the bound material that was in there. And so that's what we started to see. So sending that out, it, it was able to very quickly show that this material was having an impact on the overall um, compaction of the soil relieving some of the compaction of the soil so uh, that that's really just kind of how it came about now I, I wouldn't say you can replace although so i've done this in in multiple conversations where i've had uh been in front of people talking about aerators and all this kind of stuff there are quite a few companies who have gotten rid of all of their aerators and just stopped i mean we 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 do an awful lot of sales to companies who used to aerate and don't anymore right what we found was Not only did the operators really like using the material, and this market had to be pretty much created from scratch. I mean, three years ago, the thought of doing or talking about it three or four years ago wasn't even on anybody's radar, right? Uh, And now, like, I didn't think it was going to go as big as it did. I really didn't. I thought it would be a nice piece. Was that your like big surge moment for the growth in your company? Was that the product that you know brought you guys to the next level? Would you say? I think it was RGS originally. Okay. That one was uh, the reason that one went ballistic fast is it was easy to use with a ride on. And that was a market that we weren't really into because we were 100% liquid fertility. So I wasn't really doing a whole lot of componentry. Well, three ounces per thousand square feet and a cost on the high end of 21 cents per thousand yeah. added into just a, a basic granular. You suddenly had an incredible green space. And so it was designed to really work with the granular that was being spread. Again, allow the operator to lower their cost on what granular they're putting out, not not less amount. They didn't have to put less amount out, but they didn't have to get all of this other stuff because we had a different release rate once the RGS was put in there. And that really made some big changes. Um, But RGS and Air 8 were out at the same time. It was just that that material suddenly got a whole bunch of people hooked. And, and when I say hooked, they were like, what else you got? What else you got? And that kind of shot everything up as soon as that product was yeah. made uh, available to everybody. And then 
like I said earlier, the, the bigger guys, the billion dollar space, they were like, we need to have something now just like that. And so we see a lot of products like that out in the market now, but there still isn't one person who competes with us on price and performance. Not, yeah. not yet anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys run a quality operation and I'm old school. So like my dad grew up all granular, right? Program. Uh, and for us to do the liquids. Number one, we changed the way that we applied to lawns. We actually switched an all liquid model because it was easier to train our technicians uh, to do patterns just for us with the current labor pool as it was when I was running the company. When the sure. boom time economy, when it's hard to find good technicians at a good rate, uh, we switched to a liquid model. So it made a lot more sense. We have a question in from Nate uh, Ailman. Why not label Airy as a wedding agent? Uh, because we don't do anything that would be uh, soap-like. I know that that's been uh, something that's come up a few times with a consideration that that might be uh, a part of what it is. I mean, if you wanted to call, I don't care what people call it, but um, it, it isn't. It doesn't use uh, anything to create that uh, that sort of soap effect. Now, we compared it initially to uh, other wedding agents out there and other of those sort of soap based materials and it's just not the same in fact there were quite a few people in the beginning who uh when they when they really didn't want this to work they were doing comparisons side by side and sending pictures and putting them on instagram and all the stuff of a wedding agent that was labeled as a liquid aerate uh, aerator or something on one side of the screen and then ours on the other and the water penetration effect on something like that was non-existent because we're doing so much more with the plant that's really why it isn't a wedding agent i mean you could go out and put a wedding agent side by side, um, put it with it, and you will see one is a wedding agent and one is very much not a wedding agent. And what is a wedding agent? Like I'm from the industry. I'm really not clear. Is that like uh, those products that say you are less on your lawn? I mean, no, that would be like um, whatever, like HydraSmart or something. No, it's it's more like uh, non, like non-ionic surfactants, soaps, heavy soaps, that type of thing. So what would be the benefit of using those? Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing wedding agents. Um, a, a lot of the time, if you do have ground that is um, more compacted and you're getting pooling of water or something like that, yeah. it can help draw down into the soil a little bit. Um, it doesn't last very long. I think that's that's sort of the big thing is you, you kind of get that out one time. It drags whatever you have with it. Um, they're used an awful lot with um, like for insecticides, uh, change bugs applications and things like that to try to get yeah. it down a little bit deeper. And that's, that's really where you're going to get the benefit out of that material. Yeah. Uh, Tim Schnabel uh, dropped in. John, we don't aerate at all anymore. Thanks for saving us thousands every year. We expected pushback, but people seem to be more interested in aerate than aeration. Tim, I'd absolutely agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, we've definitely seen that at our company as well. In fact, before we phased out core aeration, right before I left, uh, People were buying both. They'd buy core aeration and liquid aeration. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's a, it, but here's the thing. When the product came, if you've never seen a liquid product before, it is insane. It looks like motor oil. Like uh -huh. it has to be good for the lawn. If I'm looking at it, I'm like, whoa, like that's, that is doing something in the turf. I leave it to John on the science, exactly what's in there, but it's doing something. And as Tim says, uh, his customers are more interested in liquid aeration than core aeration. Um, apparently there's friction on the, the homeowner side as well. Uh, oh, I have to bark my sprinkler heads. Like you're my lawn service. Like you should be doing this for me. Not, you know, like, sure. So, not so the, I, this job. brings up a great point, Tim, Tim, great to hear from you. Um, uh, you know, I think that pretty much, I, I think I can speak on this across the board when, when people went out there and they marketed this the first time to their customer base and they're like, I don't know if it's going to work. It was a 90% transition. That's huge. They're like, absolutely. Yeah, we'll take that. No problem. And so um, a lot of people got a big benefit, not just the businesses, but the customers also felt like they were seeing something as well. Like they, their turf responded better. Uh, this, this was something that they really, really could see. And the amount of people that I do have uh, who have come to me, sent me pictures and videos and I mean, you name it, of areas where they've always struggled, always had compacted soil, now have it loosened up. It's just over and over and over again. So um, it's a, it's great as part of a program. And, and I, I can't stress that enough. Is that I, Your program is important. I think people get really hung up on, on a single product like or a single product. And then further, they get hung up on a single ingredient in a product. 
And so that can really just devolve quickly. You know, if, if yeah. you're not really understanding the way the whole thing works is where you fit something into the program, when you should apply it, why you should apply it, what to expect out of it, it can all be broken down into something very small, or you got to look at the big picture of here's what we're actually getting. Yeah. Here's the overall benefit. Here's the cost. Here's the profit. Here's the whole the well, whole ball of wax. Talk about it at your lawn ecology show, uh, right? Green grass, dead weeds. People aren't mm -hmm. like the ion cations in the soil. And I know about that shit. I was in the Michigan State program, took that mm -hmm. took that program, and you're learning about all these like macro and micronutrients, which is cool stuff. But it's cool. Uh, Mrs. Jones is not buying like micro macro nutrients. She wants you no. one to look better. They're not buying right. the holes in the soil. They want a green, thick weed free lawn. They want green grass, dead weeds. And I thought that was super interesting about what the lawn ecology conference was about. Like, yes, there was lots of talk on, uh, soil health, plant fertility, but what surprised me was I had this kind of preconception going in that it was going to be a, just a total science fest, but you're, you had a, I think the 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 theme was like growing like uh grow your business or like um, yeah. the general theme that I got was I understand lawn care is your passion it is important to know the science but you need to it, unless you want to own your job right we need to have we need to grow our businesses as well growing your business is very important um, tell me about that. Why is that important for companies? And unless, I mean, I know, I, I, I know companies on both sides of the spectrum. I know companies that, um, you know, they have a very, uh, they have a hundred customers and they do every mm -hmm. lawn themselves. Mm -hmm. They're okay with that. And that's fine. Um, and they say they don't want to deal with employees or maybe they've been down that route before. What's your take on it? I mean, why why was that important at Loncology for folks to grow their business and worry about the sales and the marketing and the actual green grass dead weeds uh, for homeowners? Okay, so since I, I was small business first with with a lawn care company, um, I didn't really have uh, too much in the way of mentorship in that side, right? I, I wasn't really part of any groups. Uh, it, it seemed seemed like it was just sort of get out there and trip and fall and, and make your own way. Well, as we grew pretty much everybody in my core business that that is on my team worked or owned a lawn spray company that was part of of just knowing what we were about to get into so brad uh chad you, you name it like a uh, hunter who runs our florida operation all, all of these guys were, were deep into um uh, lawn service companies so that we could just answer questions to any operator out there and that could be from equipment to marketing to everything so for me it, it was important to show that there's really there's more than just the sales portion from from my company. We want to support the growth of our customers because that obviously impacts our growth. So if we can bring more information and, and we can mentor and we can share and and help people grow their businesses, we know that that's ultimately going to help ours grow by sort of um, feeding into the group that's that's also feeding us. So we want to give as much back as possible. We want to keep the knowledge open and free flowing and just give advice wherever we can. And then obviously connect our customer bases to, to people like you and say, you know, here's something that can benefit your business. And, you know, this is somebody I know and I, that and that kind of thing. So um, as far as the, the entrepreneurship side, you mentioned like small lawn care companies versus larger, whatever. And I know you probably heard me say, hey, you have 100 customers. Good for you. Do you want more? Right. Like I, I would say that. Is that are you happy? Yeah. You know, happy with a hundred? They're like, yeah, I'm happy with a hundred. Great. Don't grow. Okay. Yeah. But if you become the person who says no to all new business, at the time when you need new business, you're not gonna be able to get it. Right. So there, there's a piece that you sort of have to keep yourself just sort of moving forward. Even if it's low, if you don't want to deal with employees, that's fine. You are basically truly just working for yourself and just sort of owning a job and not really being an owner. Like it's, it's just, you're, you know, a true self-employed person. Yeah. What's the, what's the long ecology plan this year? Are we were in uh, you know, service mass, uh, you know, doing it or is it? No, nope, we're, we're not doing it this year. We've already pushed it off. Uh, I think we sent an email out about that. We're, we won't be back on it until 2022. What I'm hoping is uh, as we get into spring next year, I'll be able to go do some pop-ups around the country and start traveling again and, um, you know, invite some small groups into different places and have a day of, you know, training, teaching, mingling, that kind of thing and, and start yeah. doing that process again. That's That's been something that I've been wanting to get back into anyway. 
kind of noticed that with growing lawn bot, there's just been these hubs that have been popping up. So one is Georgia, obviously a huge lawn, probably one of the best lawn care markets in the country come to find mm-hmm. out. Uh, from the standpoint, you service most of the year. And also there's just a lot of people there, <laughs> especially. Yeah. Uh, I just didn't realize that living in Michigan. So it's one area that really stuck out. I was like, we should bring back the old dog and pony show and take it around the country to these. It's great. Maybe we should do it together. Lawn Cow, Lawn Bot, we'll make it a, make it a thing. Um, It's, it is really fun to do. And and if you do have the time and and the wherewithal to do it, the one thing that I'll say in this, uh, in the space coming up is there's a lot of people that are going to be missing uh, face-to-face interaction. And uh, it'll be very important to start having some in-person meetings again, yeah, uh, I do have one coming up, which I'm excited is not getting canceled. And that's the Landscape Management Growth Summit in Orlando, uh, first week of December. So that's pretty great to be able to get back down. There's a small group, uh, but that that one is um, I'm, I'm just a I'm happy to be traveling. Yeah. And B, it's great to get out and, um, you know, meet some people, create some new business relationships and, and uh, keep on keep on keeping on. I might see you there. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I might just show up. Be like, hey, yeah, I, I, I like because last, yeah, last year. <laughs> I mean, you remember the circuit? I mean, the uh-huh. real mention, uh, the lawn ecology show. There was like four other shows we did: GIE, lawn and land mm-hmm. that conference. Like, we hit the circuit, and and that's really important to people in the, these industries, if not to learn about new technologies, to see their buddies and catch up. And mm-hmm. hey, how did this year go? Like, what are you guys working on? What were your, what were the challenges in your business? And let's go drink a beer together. Like exactly, <laughs> exactly. I think that man, I just, it's going to be weird not doing that this year. It, it just, uh, I'm kind of happy about it. Like if, it, you know, if we're talking about changes in the industry, yeah. I'm, I'm a little happy about it. Like I kind of go, I oscillate back and forth, but from, from October one through say February 15th, it's show after show after show, some, small stuff that nobody's heard of, uh, some groups that we've been involved in for a decade. Um, I mean, I'm sitting on a planning committee as a chair, uh, chairperson on one for Florida. I've got two events coming up in, in January and June for down there for the Florida Pest Management Association. Um, I mean, it's it's a lot and, and it's very overwhelming with all that travel. A couple of years ago with the way things were spaced, I was gone from home, I think for 22 days straight in January, just because it was show, 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 show. And there was no reason to fly back between them. Yeah. So uh, it, it'll be, it'll be okay uh, not doing that, but I'll tell you what, uh, as soon as shows open back up, I think they're going to be the best attended they've ever been. Booming. Boom. Yeah. I think, yeah, just, just absolutely bonkers. Tell me about COVID. How'd you guys fare during COVID? I mean, I, I think it's really interesting in this industry that we service the, in large part, the end users, the homeowner, right? the people that hire mm-hmm. on services. How did you guys fare during COVID? I, the people I talked to says they grew during COVID. Is that, is that what you're finding too on your end? That oh yeah. Most of your yeah. customers. There's, oh, it, this year has been wild. Okay. So um, when everything started to really shut down, which is back in March, or, you know, right at the peak of marketing and springtime sales for lawn care, everybody got terrified. But I think that only lasted about like three weeks. That's what it seemed like. It was like a small little blip. But in the moment, it felt like it could be devastating for the year. Uh, however, from every lawn care come well, let's, let's say 99.8%. I'm going to say 99.8% of the people I've talked to have grown this year and, and have continued to grow. And some at huge amounts, some at maybe a slightly, slightly less rate than they projected. Um, but they were already going for some pretty massive numbers. So uh, it's been a really good year for the service industry and and for the supply uh, side, from the manufacturing side, because the amount of people that were at home and looking to beautify their space, that was huge. And yeah. now if there's all these other people that bought lawn care this year who maybe wouldn't have in the past, they're now, they're in the universe. And they will continue to be in there because it's rare to have somebody pop off and go back to doing it themselves. They might try it a year and then they're going to come back and find a professional. Tell so, me about your residential business. I know you, you sell B2B, but you also, I was mm-hmm. on your website last night and I noticed you have a considerable like uh, homeowner business as well, right? Like people yeah, buy it's to, huge. to do it themselves. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, so we took a very simplistic approach. Um, what kind of sparked all that is there were, there were two guys, um, Pete Denny, 
uh, from GCI Turf Services. You can yeah. see him on YouTube and Alan Hain, the lawn care nut, those two guys. I talked to uh, Pete. Uh, he he started using product in his own business um, a year before he started offering it to some of his viewers. And Alan actually came and sat in um, at Real Green when we were in uh, St. Pete's a few years ago down at, at that show. He came and sat on one of my lectures. I didn't know who he was. And he started talking to the camera about uh, so the stuff he learned about sharing and and our phones just started to light up. So we had to create a um, DIY product offering. We, yeah. we didn't have one. We didn't do any bottling. We didn't do anything that wasn't bulk. So it was all done and quick. I mean, within 10, 10 to 12 days, we had a whole thing done that we were going to offer. And the way we approached it was we took what I would consider to be the most uh, dynamic additions to a fertilizer program. So uh, the RGS that I spoke about earlier, aerate, uh, just a uh, straight humic acid and a micronutrient product. And we put them into one package and we called it the BioStim pack. And that thing sounds like hotcakes. And the beauty of it is you can't screw it up. So, you know, <laughs> people put it out heavy and it's not going to hurt anything because a gallon of, of RGS does an acre. But people loved what it was doing to their lawn so much. They might have a 5,000 square foot lawn. They burn through that gallon. Like, I got to get more of this stuff. <laughs> it doesn't replace fertilizer, right? It, no. It, no, that's just an addition. Okay. Got gotcha. it. Yeah. And so so what we've tried to do, in what, am I, what I've been trying to educate people on, is how much they can actually simplify that NPK side so that they're not having to spend extra money on, on uh, anything that's added into a bag where you can get a better result out of whatever those hard things are with a liquid, you add that in afterwards, you end up saving money and getting a better result. Yeah. That's all. Let's switch gears for a second. Now I love all your knowledge on the turf space. I love what you guys are doing with green County for talk to me about your YouTube you're like YouTube famous, right? Like I'm sure you get autographs when you go places. Like, oh my god! <laughs> I need uh, autograph. Tell me about like. Can you get me some, some subscribers? I think we're up to 34. I think. 30, hey, wow! Well, yeah, I remember. I remember working, those days. Working out. How did you grow so big? I think it's just dropping content that speaks to the market's demands. What I mean, what is that specifically? Well, I I, I think I, I had help. Okay, I think that that's part of it is uh, I didn't want to get into the space. I didn't want to. I, I, I owe that to Alan and Pete because they started selling these biostimulant packs and people had so many questions and they really weren't ready yet to answer that. So I started the channel to address a lot of that information. So it was easy to get content created because of the questions that were coming in. And, you know, if, if somebody like that who has more of an audience is mentioning you, you you'll pick up some subscribers. So I, I think that the first initial push, it took me, uh, let's say, I think it was in June of 2018. Uh, so it took me about four months or five months to have a thousand subscribers, which I thought was incredible. I couldn't even believe it. Like a thousand subscribers, this is yeah. nuts. And, um, and and I asked people, I was like, is that fast? I mean, it's not fast for somebody who's, who's doing makeup tutorials, right. uh, but for a long guy, maybe it is. Um, and then it, it grew pretty well. Beyond that, uh, I added about 10,000 subscribers in the following year. Um, and so far this year, maybe it's been another 7,500 or, or whatever has gone on this year. And it, it just now it really does grow on its own. Um, but I don't I don't personally feel like I have a, a real commercial approach. I just sort of make what I want to talk about. Right. And and I do a style that might be speaking to me. I'm trying to learn more camera tricks and things like that. So part of it, it feeds my creative side right. um, when I get stuff out there. And and I try, I, I don't really like to talk about the normal stuff. So I'm a, I'm a little fringy for for a, the normal lawn care guy, you know, because right. I, I might get into things that they're like, well, that, that's cool. I mean, I'm never going to tell anybody about this. You know? <laughs> um, so so I, do, I do have a lot of fun with it. And uh you know, it, it continues to grow and I find inspiration with it. And um, I don't know where it ends. I, that part, I don't know. I, I so, can't quite so figure you're, that you're out. kind of feeding your own creative uh, mm -hmm. desires there, right? With doing content. Do you do it all yourself? Like all your, do, yeah. all your editing, posting yeah. and everything? You do it all yourself. And sometimes I put the music together myself as well. Actually, in the most recent video that you were playing, uh, the very end song I, I, I put together and, and composed out and put it for the last 
part of it. But there's a whole cooking section in that last video that you were showing at the beginning of the show. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we're getting towards the end of the time here. Uh, I always like to leave it with, you know, asking folks that are on the show um, a similar question. And that question is, you know, what, what advice would you have to the lawn care operator that, you know, maybe they're at 150 K in revenue, maybe they're at 200 K or whatever. And they're trying to go from one truck to two trucks. What advice do you have to that person that is wanting to grow their business? What advice would you have for that person? I mean, there's so much like conflicting data out there. What would you say to that person that, Hey, John, I want to go from one truck to two trucks. What do I do next? For me, it's always marketing back into your base. I think that um, the best thing you can ever do is is bring a new product or service, uh, get into areas that you were considering getting into. I mean, whether that be quarterly pest control or adding a tree shrub program or something like that. I say you market into your current base because they know you, they trust you, they know your story. And what can end up happening is not only will you end up boosting your revenue, uh, but you will have to add that second truck. And and the more time that you're outside and the more visibility that you get in a neighborhood and, and just being out and about is what's going to ultimately grow the business more than any other aggressive marketing campaign. It's yeah. it's people seeing you on a lawn. That is ultimately oh, what's going to grow it. I, I would have to echo that. We call it low hanging fruit. Uh, mm -hmm. All of us have it in our business. And sometimes some people I talked about it at your longcology conference. Some people don't have that data. They don't have right. like they're running off of a spreadsheet possibly mm -hmm. have 300 customers sitting in a spreadsheet. And I asked them, well, do you have a list of people that you gave quotes to the last 10 years? And they're like, Oh shit, I don't like mm -hmm. getting that data is so important. Um, you know, all of the, the people you've ever quoted that didn't sign up, but then also keeping a list of people that cancel your service. Yes. There's, there's a 20, percent chance that that person that canceled your service if you just call them and say hey how i want to win your business back how, how do you how do we do it yeah. um they're going to sign back up with you so i have to echo that completely i mean let's let's get the low-hanging fruit before absolutely we're trying to get so, a new customer, right we didn't have in my spray service you know real green was functioning back then and we tried i don't remember what we tried to do some software back in the mid 2000s and it really wasn't great uh, it was for for me I, I never really understood what was happening my tech was like i don't even know how to use a cell phone so i mean it was really a challenging to like bring people up so we had a massive filing cabinet and everything was done in triplicate uh all the forms were signed in that everything went you know in into a huge file cabinet and uh the one thing that we did do is I really pushed tree and shrub. Like that was the big thing is because I wanted to have as many applications on a single person's lawn as possible. So all we would do is when we would send out a paper invoice is we would write a handwritten note. Hey, don't forget about your trees and shrubs. And we would put that in there and we would just convert people all the time. And that made business boost like crazy. Why? So, you think, why uh, Chris Stout just. Good old Chris. Yeah, Chris, Chris. First year in business, right? He said he's up to 200 customers and just ordered a truck from Florida Sprayer. I see him hustling out there on mm -hmm. Instagram and Facebook. Uh, I think he's got a Stinger aerator too, which is pretty cool. Yeah, man, um, he's, he's been killing it. Chris, you know, he came and he spoke this year. He was at Longcology also with with us and, and talked about growing a business and how he's going to. And he had nobody at the beginning of the year. He's like, I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to do all this stuff that I'm yeah. talking about right now and I'm going to grow a business. And we're like, damn straight, you know, get yeah. out there and knock it out. It's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. It's an amazing thing that in this country that we live in, the greatest country in the world, that you could just start knocking on doors and uh, get up to two, three hundred customers. And Chris is young; he's got a lot of life left to live. I think he's going to grow a very Maybe. big company. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he's going to grow a very big company. Uh, I mean, especially this this industry just lends itself to hard work. Like yes, it does. Go out there and knock on doors and do the hard shit that other people don't want to do you gotta uh, do it you know you're you have the ability to attain success in this industry i think there's one piece i would add to that too i think it's important uh and, and it's not a be all end all but for for a guy who owns a, a lawn care company like chris and like what you've done you, you know we all were out in the field you know knowing exactly how the business has to run from the ground up and so it's uh it's it's interesting to see a guy move from being a tech 
into like a true business owner in the office and making moves and um and growing the business, but knowing that he could go out at any day and run a route with yeah. no trouble, yeah. right? And and I think that's really super important. So we just had another question come in. Nate uh, asked, can you grow being the most expensive in your market? I think that's a great question. I don't think I've ever even answered this one. Um, we have a unique perspective at LawnBot because I always, I tell it to people all the time. I think People buy the people buying through Lawnbot aren't buying on price. They're buying on convenience, and they're willing to pay more to buy conveniently. Mm -hmm. I, yes, my answer is yes. You absolutely can grow by being the most expensive in your market. I think there's always a market for the best product. Look at Apple. Look at how big sure. Apple is. They're like way more expensive than many of the Android options, and um, people buy it because it's easy. It works every time, and it, it works with all their other devices. I mean, what? what What's your take on yeah, that? Yeah, I absolutely think you can. What what I think that I see more than anything else is that uh, there there are people who come in the door being very expensive, and and it can turn customers off. Now that could be a, a tactic that's being used for uh, for them to control growth, which is one thing that they don't really want to necessarily go on, or you know they're not happy with having to fix all of these other lawn problems that they might be getting from other lawn care companies. But it seems like there's a lot of people who come in the door super, super cheap. But by the time a customer looks at their bill at the end of the season, they've been hit for all of this other stuff. You yeah. know, it just adds up and adds up and adds up. And it might be things that they're like, well, I don't remember, you know, this or that. And 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 they then all of a sudden they are paying the most expensive, but they came in the door thinking they were going to get the best deal. Um, what's really interesting to me is, is in the marketplace around the country, it is so different. Like, you know, fertility costs seem to be pretty fixed, like around the country. It doesn't vary a whole lot. So there's a per certain cost per thousand that seems to be pretty, pretty easy to budget no matter where in the country you are. But I have people in, in down in Florida that are charging between 22 and $27 per thousand feet. That's, that's their regular going rate. Where in some other places in the country, it's like $4.25 to like six dollars a thousand and they're yeah. putting down the same thing right but it's just what the market will bear in that area right john Payjack just popped in know your number Payjack. know your trade he's actually gonna be the guest on next week's show nice I'm, I'm i love listening to him talk he's so man is it great I yeah love that guy he calls me all the time and um mm. He's like, I didn't know your wife was Russian. And I was like, yeah, she's Russian. And he's like, I actually speak Russian. And I'm like, really? That's not something I would have ever thought of. John, <laughs> the man pay Jack. Uh, yeah. John says, know your numbers and know your trade. And you can be at the top of your market. I would yeah. have to agree with you, John. That's uh, absolutely. I, and I, that's, again, one of those things that are easy to sort of uh, slide out, out of the way is you, you just get caught up in the work and, and, I mean, I've seen companies, I've talked to people who are spending so much per thousand on their materials. And I'm like, why are you doing all this? And what is the benefit that you're getting? Well, we just want to absolutely use the best. Well, is it the best because it's priced high or is it the best because it's the best? Because right. if your competitor who you say is the number one competitor for you is only paying 95 cents a thousand and you're paying $5 a thousand, oh. are you five times better? That's a, that's a valid question. And I think it's yeah. in everybody's mind when they're building a, their program for the next season is what's our cost per thousand. So let's talk about that. Uh, we're already over the time. So let's just say screw it. Keep going. What should yeah. these costs when you're building a fertility program, let's say mm -hmm. we're in a cool season market. Sure. Um, what should I do? What's a good cost per thousand? Would you say it, it, for a cool season fertility program? So typically for us, we tend to average out um, around a dollar, maybe a dollar fifteen per thousand square feet per application. That's about where we come out on all of our programs. So when we build out a full uh, full gamut, you average it through the course of the year. You may only be at a dollar per thousand per round for yeah. your fertility, and that's that's kind of where I try to keep it. Now, um, there, there's a wide range of the way people look at their budgets: uh, big companies, small companies, everything else. For a long time, uh, Furt and Kim was averaging out around like 18% of, of their gross, right? About 18%. Um, I, I do have customers that are down in the 9% range, uh, 9 to 11. That's getting pretty low. But I think for the most part, if you're able to keep your cost 18% or lower, you're doing really, really well. 
So that that's sort of how I would budget that out uh, from both fertilizer and chemical. That's not not just one or the other. So usually, it, about ten or twelve percent of that is going to be fertilizer, and the other uh, six eight percent of that is going to be uh, other chemicals that are being used. That's helpful. I think it's it's actually to get somebody's because you have some tribal knowledge uh, with having. I don't know how many companies you deal with, but you a lot. Get, you get to deal with a lot of different companies, yeah, a lot of different sizes. So for folks to have that number of, you know, around 18%, if you be 18% of gross, I think that that's really helpful for them. Joe Pazzi pops in, uh, SOS, statement of service, should always be, have a small square of current specials, so to speak. Things like, don't forget to ask about our fall aeration specials or ask about this. I think where Joe's headed with this comment is you should always be upselling your clients. Absolutely. Uh, I, I remember very early on, in my growth when I was growing my parents' business before I bought it from them was I'd be on the lawn doing like the fertilizing because I like did it myself initially, right? Like we all did at mm -hmm. some point. And I'd see like an Orkin truck pull up and then start spraying the house. I'm like, what the, like, like, and, and that's when it kind of clicked in my mind. The homeowners ne doesn't have something against me personally. Like they didn't, I'm not saying F you Kendall, like we hired Orkin because you suck. They are hiring Orkin because they don't know that you do that service. Bingo. And I think it's something that we need to do as an industry more and more is we think we send out one email and they know that we do that service. I mean, people we know that people's lives are busy and it, it it's it's convenient for our customers if they can hire one company to do everything, right? Mosquito, lawn, perimeter, yeah. pets, tree and shrub, like you mentioned. We That's need actually even from that scale up to what, what I'm doing now, that's something that we we got into last year uh, and, and didn't really push it. We didn't really market it hard, but we carry a full complement of chemicals as well. And uh, going being able to go direct, just like we do B2B, we can do that with all of, with every lawn chemical, insecticide, fungicide, any pesticide that you need. We've got it all. Uh, a deep catalog. Wow. Um, I didn't and know that. See, I, see, I didn't know that. Exactly. In the industry, and I didn't know that you're playing in the chemical space. I thought you were just the soil fertility man. And we're doing it all. <laughs> you know, I, I uh, years ago, you know, our, um, for Green County Fertilizer Company, GCFC, right? Like that was, I, I, at one point I had planned to have that, just that GCFC on a hat. And, and the goal of that over time was it to evolve into Green County Fert and Kim. Uh, so, you know, that we could start establishing our space, it, it not necessarily change the name, but have it be a sort of acrimonious that way that people got it. And, um, I, uh, we're pushing a lot harder this year. In fact, probably our customers all got emails about our EOP this week, uh, and what we're doing because it went extremely well, uh, last year. And we, we, again, doing that sort of disruptive space, we're selling all across the country, uh, and able to, you know, get a pallet together with here's your, here's your FERT order and here's some boxes of this on top yeah. and send it out the door. What's the status for our Canadian friends? I know that our friends in Canada, do you guys ship to Canada? Is that a thing? No. You're not allowed to cross. Why is that mm -hmm. a government thing? So really uh, we, we did actually have uh, some Canadian customers uh, in the past that they would just come and pick stuff up in Washington or um, in New York or, you know, wherever they could come down and grab things and, and shoot across. Um, and we, we haven't really pushed it all that hard in the last while. And there are some good companies up there um, that, you know, are, are, are wonderful to work with, but I didn't go through the process of registering um, with the ministry of agriculture up there because at the time there were two guys. And if you're watching out there, two guys in Canada <laughs> who control all of that, Bob, Bob, uh, it is good to, uh, I hope you guys are doing well, eh? And uh, we will probably try to get back in there and, and be able to make our products available. The, the, here's yeah. the kicker, though. Um, one thing I'm like very conscious about is shipping and freight and, and those types of costs that can come from being really far away. And so sometimes I avoid going into a market space just because I don't think that the person is going to end up getting the best value right. because of the additional cost it could take to get there. Gotcha. So shipping in freight That's obviously messy. play a huge role in your business. Mm -hmm. uh, and you guys leverage well, FedEx loves us. <laughs> I was just gonna say uh, your your uh, channel partners FedEx, um, some oh, of the other ones that had shipped to us, which was made it really easy. Honestly, you can like track where when your shipment's gonna be there, and guy drops the gate. Oh, they're on it. 
brings it into the warehouse. Coming Freight moves hot. faster than their packages most of the time. <laughs> Coming in hot from Georgia. Yeah, it's true. Uh, that's awesome. So what's the what's the vision? I mean, you guys have a lot have had a lot of success so far uh, with growing GCF. I mean, mm -hmm. is it to continue expanding? I know you just mentioned the the chemical side, but is it to continue expanding different products that you know uh, your customers can leverage? Is it you know what what's the future hold for GCF? Oh man, uh, well it's bigger. It's a lot bigger uh, right now. We're we're in the midst of um, adding a massive bottling line, uh, a, a huge huge bottling line. Uh, we're already in looks of building another twin building next to the one we've got uh, to try to double our, our production and floor space uh, over the next year or two. Um, there, there are new products that will be coming out as well. And, and I tend to try to look into the areas that are often overlooked uh, to try to create something new in the space. Um, because again, as a small business owner and as a, as a lawn care operator, you want as many um, possibilities for revenue as you can, right? And so it's again like talking about these extra services, or what can you what can you put on? What can what can be something that your customers might go for? So I've got a couple other things that I've been working on, um, and it, it's weird to actually sort of have that feeling that we. I'm not going to call us a household name yet. But but very much there is there's starting to be a feel of that like people kind of know who it is right not like if you just walked up to somebody on the street who was holding a bag of Scots you couldn't just say hey you know Green County Fertilizer Company like no I'm like, like Do you know what you just bought like, probably yeah not. everybody knows the Scots four step program mm -hmm. that's what we ask customers like oh I've been doing it myself okay well have you been doing like the Scots four step program or do you just go to right. the, the warehouse and buy whatever's there yes. So your household name now? I I know. No, 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 no. I said, not quite household. In my household, actually, my yeah. kids don't even know the name of my company. My household too, right? I was like, yeah, we got John <laughs> Perry, YouTube celebrity, on our show today. Um, how now? How did you grow Green County to the side? Did you guys leverage channel partners? I know that you have a lot of channel partners now, but in the early days, was it? It was basically just YouTube content. Was it knocking on doors? Was it cold calling people? Oh, okay. So the for the DIY side, it was all about the original people talking about it on YouTube because it was new and it was unique and people hadn't tried and they were trying to figure out how to use it. And so that side continues to just grow. Yeah. Uh, the trajectory on the pro side has always been constant, constant growth uh, year over year. And that a lot of that is the trade shows, um, any speaking opportunity that I can get, you know, sponsoring certain groups, uh, you know, working with different nursery and landscape organizations and associations um, key marketing in, in paper still, uh, because, you know, we would continue to do things in like, uh, landscape management and lawn and landscape and even turf magazine. Uh, I had an article written about me. I want to say it was back in like 2010 in turf magazine, uh, when BioGreen was starting to make a push. Uh, and so some of those things have really helped, but I think to be honest, a lot of it is, is been word of mouth. It's been groups. It's been people who said, look, I use this and here's why I use it. And here's the tool that I use. You know, nobody has to be a hundred percent in, in one company's basket. Like I, I don't need to have that much of anybody's business, but if we have a product in there that works and, and expands your particular, um, offering, then that's huge. We want to be a piece of that. We want, we want to find a little piece in, in everybody's operation that can benefit them, which ultimately is obviously good for us, but it, it gets more people into the conversation and the opportunity for somebody to say, Hey, you know, I don't do a hundred percent with them, but I use this one thing and I use it twice a year. And this is what it does for me. And people are like, yeah. great. I want to get on that program as well. Well, I think about how we heard about you and it was on in the Facebook groups, seeing other, like you mm -hmm. met girls, everybody else talking about green County and how much they loved it. And we were pretty strict granular folks up until yes. that point. And we, we were like, okay, well, what does this, gr what does this liquid path look like? Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's somebody on the West coast in Colorado, actually, uh, that they switched their whole operation over to liquid and they are running strictly liquid because it was an easy, easier service delivery method. Mm -hmm. We really started taking a hard look. And when I got on the phone with Brad, he walked me through like, um, 
you know, he's like, Kendall, I've converted a lot of granular people over to our, our, our liquid fertility. So, you know, he kind of held my hand through the process because obviously it's kind of nervous to, I mean, if, if you've been doing something for 18 years to try to change how you've been doing it, it could be a little scary for somebody. Absolutely. What do you say, what do you say to people that are running a granular only program? I've been doing it that way for 30 years without any issues. I mean, I know there's, there's some science behind, uh, product cycling, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. um, turf can get resistant to certain things if, if, if you're using the same methods on it. Yeah, sure. What would you say to somebody that's considering a liquid program over granular? Uh, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, I think yeah, that just com- it comes down to preference. Yeah. I think more than anything else, there's a lot of companies that will never switch over. And it, it's funny, uh, okay, I need to just tell this real quick. What happens a lot is I might be talking to a company at a trade show and say, oh, no, we're 100%. We, we are 100% granular. We don't do any liquids. I'm like, okay, what are you using for uh, you know your applications? Oh, we're using steel greens or Z-sprays or, or whatever it is. I'm like, oh. So what do you do with the liquid tanks? They're like, well, that's what we spray our liquids out of. Yeah. Like, well, you just told me you were 100% granular. Oh, no, we do liquid at this time, this time, this time. Boom. Okay, so here's the opening. This is how right. we start. So um, for the most part, I don't ever try to go after like somebody who's got 40 or 50 ride-ons. Uh, that's not necessarily a company that I'm going to say, hey, you should convert to liquid. I'm not going to say that. I'm like, you know, run your granular, but here's something you can put in your tank twice a year that's going to make that better. Mm -hmm. So, so we take that approach for a lot of companies, but I think initially, uh, and and since you kind of went both ways, you started with granular and then maybe you threw a liquid truck out there so you could do it. You you can kind of see how the the whole process works. I was just always a liquid guy. And to be honest with you, I never wanted to be in the granular space. I, I think that the competition is super, super high, number one. And unless you are positioned very, very close to your end user, it's, it, it's not worth it. Uh, it, it. It just costs too much to ship a bag or a ton of granular when you don't get the coverage. Where on the on the low side, our liquids that are you know our nitrogenous liquids are going to get around forty to fifty acres out of a tote. And you know if you're shipping granular, a mixed bag or mixed fur, you might get eight. And so your cost to ship that same size package, it, it's the same amount of money, but you need five times as much granular to get what you're doing with the liquid out. So, uh, you know, that was, that was just something I, I, I couldn't really get behind. And, and I think that oftentimes the cost of those uh, granulars, especially some of these um, more boutique brands, are just so high and the application rates are high um, that I, I find myself taking people backwards and saying, you know, you, what you should look for is just an NPK that's this, this, and this without all of this stuff, right? And spread that just to get your core nutrition down and then again, you add stuff on the backside to make it even more effective. Yeah. That's awesome. We have one more question and we're going to wrap it up here. This is from Blades Davis. How close would you suggest to get to concrete uh, with the liquid products? Since most products stain, how will the product move in the soil? So I'm guessing he's asking. You know, yeah. So uh, all of this is going to come down to uh, product, uh, amount of water being used, uh, you know, what your overall dilution rate is, uh, all of that kind of stuff. So when I would spray at uh, three gallons per minute, that was what my unit ran at. That, but I didn't really have any problem doing any sort of overspray uh, if I came around the side of of a house or, or concrete or sidewalk or anything like that. It's nothing that you could really see. If you're mixing a much stronger um, dilution, then you might have some issues with really anything you're spraying out. Now, for me, I was I, I typically took the technique of starting wherever the hard space was and then spraying away from it anyway. So I would come right up to the edges no matter what. Yeah. I didn't walk around and paint it. I had I had my own thing where I start, you could see the droplet and you just go. So um, you know, for the most part, when you're putting down um when you're putting down uh fertilizer and it is going to get watered in, you, you know, you have to picture the soil. It nothing moves directionally like this. It kind of has to go like this down through the soil. That's it's, there's just things that has to move around. So, you know, when you get close to the edges, yeah, you're going to have some that'll kind of kind of work in that sort of pyramidal type fashion where you, you can get over towards the edges if you're not right on it. So a lot of this is just, again, application technique. You shouldn't be spraying impermeable surfaces bottom line. I mean, that's in your, your test. That is in your applicator's test. Don't go spray fences. Don't go spray houses. Don't spray onto sidewalks. Those are not, they can't grow 
if you put fertilizer right. on them. So right. Right. avoid that at all costs. It, it ends up it, it ends up just costing the operator money by the by the right. end of the season if yeah. you're going over and not putting products on the lawn. Yeah, especially at scale. So mm -hmm. John, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on Lawn Bot Live. I'm sure we could go for two hours. Like, oh, oh man, we just need to get. Day. Well, maybe we'll do a maybe we'll do a joint show. Maybe we should do like a, a, a panel or something. That'd be fun. There you go. It's new COVID. Yeah. I mean, thanks for coming on Lawn Bot Live today. Uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. I, it looks like we got some comments coming in. John, uh, maybe you could go answer those after the show. I know, I know that you're on social. You can pop in on the comments and answer those after the show. I'm sure, I could probably where find it. Follow you. Uh, where Where do they learn and more about everything you're talking about? Is is where do people find you? Okay, so uh, pretty since the word is made up, if you just type in Loncology anywhere on your computer screen, you're going to find me. So uh, <laughs> if if you want to follow along on YouTube. Loncology on YouTube, uh, Loncology.com is another place. And then our, our company websites are GreenCountyFert.com. Uh, you can get on over there and, and check in. But we have, um, uh, I believe, I, I'm pretty sure I have a, a Loncology Instagram that I never post to. Somebody else does that. Like, that's the one thing I don't do. I never even, I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of followers on there and I never put anything on it. Uh, so you can find Loncology on Insta as well. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're kind of everywhere. It's not too difficult. Boom. I just dropped your YouTube channel in the comments. So you're going to get 10,000 new uh, subscribers. After well, that. That's what you need though. You you need, you need those. Yeah, I know. I know. Go like and share the stream. Go subscribe. Yeah. We really appreciate it. We love bringing on guests like John Perry and many other folks. Uh, John, thanks for coming on the show today and uh, we'll catch you next time. I Sounds really good, buddy. Take care. Yeah, absolutely. So if uh, you're still watching the stream next week, we have on John Pajak, the one and only the turf boy or not turf boy, the turf tamer, uh, lawn care. Super excited to have John Pajak on the show. Make sure you tune in. Uh, we're we're going to be putting out the reminder. And uh, also if you join the lawn bot lounge, which is to connect into our lawn bot Facebook page, you'll get reminders before the show. That way you never miss an episode. So we're planning on having more of these guests like John Perry, people in the industry who are doing big things, who have done big things. And we want to get the knowledge from people like John Perry out to the world and documented for consumption. So until next week, we'll see you on Lawn Bot Live. And uh, thanks for tuning in.